Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad to have you. And if you're a returning subscriber, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. It is that time where we discuss my favorite books of 2023. So in full transparency, as I was going through a spreadsheet of all the books that I read in 2023 and looking at my ratings, I did make some changes. So at the start, when I first looked at it, I had about five five-star reads and about 10 4.5 star reads. And then after kind of really sitting there with my feelings on it a little bit, I made a few ratings adjustments and I think that's okay. I think that's fair because we tend to rate books immediately after we finish them when the emotions might be really high and it might lend us to rate a book higher than we might otherwise normally have. And now after time has passed, what I feel really warrants the higher rating are the books that really have stuck with me. So some ratings I've downgraded, some ratings I've upgraded. So I was left with four five-star ratings and seven 4.5-star ratings. And so I wanted to make this an even 10, but I'm going to go ahead and have one honorable mention in this video because I really didn't want to downgrade it from a 4.5 to a 4 just because of how much I absolutely enjoyed the story so very much. So emotionally, it's probably not a 4.5. It's probably closer to a 4, but I just had such a good time reading it and I never hear anybody talk about the book that I'm going to mention so I really did want to include it in this video. So again I'm going to have a top 10 plus one honorable mention and obviously I'm going to be starting with my 4.5s and then moving on up into the fives but for the most part they're really not in any particular order. All of my five star ratings are so completely different from each other and I love them for very different reasons so I don't really feel like I can accurately rank them and then similarly with the 4.5s I love all of the 4.5s equally and they've all stuck with me throughout the entirety of the year since I've read them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start with my honorable mention. That is going to be A Blizzard of Polar Bears by Alice Henderson. I have raved about this series ever since I discovered it last year with A Solitude of Wolverines, which is the very first book in the series. And I hear absolutely nobody talk about these and I really feel like they do warrant more popularity. So if you're not familiar, this follows our main character, Dr. Alex Carter. She is a wildlife biologist and in each of the books, she is on some kind of conservation mission. So in the very first book, she was living on a rural Montana nature preserve where she was trying to study and conserve wolverines and in this story as you can probably tell from the title she is in I think it was like northern Canada in the northern Canadian wilderness studying polar bears and so you're following her journey as she's trying to save the polar bears but in each of these stories there's somebody out there that doesn't want her to be doing her job they don't want her to save these creatures they want the land for other uses so she consistently finds herself in danger now the third book A Ghost of Caribou I don't know if it takes place in a wintry isolation setting like the first two but the first two definitely do and they are certainly up there as some of my top wintry isolation thrillers of all time so if you are looking for a a solid isolation thriller, especially a wintry one. You cannot go wrong with this series. I just think that they are fast paced. They're page turning. They're going to keep you on the edge of your seat. And I especially like the additional education that Alice Henderson gives about wildlife conservation, the anthropogenic threats to them, basically all human related reasons why a lot of these beautiful creatures are endangered, but she does it without feeling preachy. It's a very natural part of the story because of the career of our main character. And I just love all of the aspects as they flow together. And I think she just does a really great job of creating a solid thriller experience. Now, are there aspects of the stories that are a little bit far-fetched that cause you to suspend your disbelief? Absolutely. But I think that could be for the most part any thriller that you read. And I just feel like these are extremely well-crafted and I highly recommend, especially if you like the wintry isolation thrillers, if you love more nature-focused thrillers, this is definitely the one for you. I cannot wait to get to A Ghost of Caribou. And I know that there's at least one more book coming out in the Dr. Alex Carter series, which I will certainly be picking up when it is released. So I definitely wanted to go ahead and mention this here because I I enjoyed this one immensely. All right, now moving on into my official top 10, we're going to start with the 4.5s, starting with The Friend Zone by Abby Jimenez. I actually just recently read this in December and I really feel like it needed to make this list just because of how much I absolutely loved the relationship in this story. Now, if you watched the lengthy spoiler-filled review that I gave in my mid-month December wrap-up, you will know that this book is not without its faults and I definitely had some criticisms and I can understand why some people really dislike the book for basically the ending of the story. But if you watched that review, you will also know why I absolutely love the story and why I can overlook some of the criticisms because I do think that Abby Jimenez does a really great job of explaining her choices in here in the author's note. So basically this follows our two main characters, Kristen and Josh. They meet because their two best friends are getting married to each other and both Kristen and Josh are going to be in the wedding party. They don't have a great first meeting, but then they start to build a friendship because Josh starts working for Kristen part-time. She has an online retail company that caters to small dogs and he is a carpenter by hobby and he basically starts building these little stairs that dogs can 
needs to get up onto furniture. And so he's working for her part time. And as he does, he starts to really fall for Kristen. And for her part, Kristen starts to fall for Josh as well. But at the time the story begins, she's in a long term relationship with a military man. But you see that relationship kind of implode and her start to act on her feelings for Josh. The problem is, is that Kristen is not willing to let it go further than friends with benefits because she knows that Josh wants a big family someday. And she knows that she cannot give that to him because she has uterine issues. She's had uterine issues her entire life. It makes her periods very debilitating every month. They're very lengthy. They're very heavy. And her quality of life is not great with this uterine condition. And so she has decided to have a hysterectomy. And so because of that, she's very much keeping Josh at arm's length. But also she's not really telling him why. She's just saying this is never going to go further than friends with benefits, which definitely was frustrating during the story. You just kind of wanted to slap her over the head and say, Kristen, talk to Josh about this. Let him make his own decision. But even when he did find out what was going on with Kristen, she still would not let him make that decision. She was not going to let him make that decision because she just knew that if they were together, he was going to start resenting her. But ultimately you're following them as they're trying to overcome these hurdles and what happens at the very end of the story. I'm not really going to go in depth on my thoughts and feelings about this book because like I said, I did that in my very lengthy spoiler filled review of this book, which I will try to remember to leave linked down below. But the reason that I wanted to include it here, the reason why this book is a 4.5 is the same reason why I've loved every single one of Abby Jimenez's books so far. And that's because she creates these incredibly dynamic, wonderful love interests, especially the male love interest. I just love the way that she's able to create these male love interests who are both sensitive and tough at the same time. They're just the perfect combination of cinnamon roll and manly man. And I can't really describe it any better than that. But furthermore, she's able to create palpable chemistry, fantastic banter, and incredibly painful moments within her stories. Like when you are reading her stories, you are absolutely able to feel the emotions of the characters. Every single book that I've read by her, my chest has just absolutely ached with the pain that the characters are feeling. And I think that it just takes a phenomenal author to be able to do that. And so because of that, I still think about the story. I still think about Kristen and Josh and their relationship and how much I love them and rooted for them. And because of that, this is such a solid romance for me. And I had to include it in my top 10 spot. This next one is one that I actually don't think I've talked about very much on my channel since I read it, but it is absolutely worthy of the 4.5 that I gave it. The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. Kate Quinn is definitely becoming an auto by historical fiction author. And that is especially true after reading this. Now, this is not a thin book, y'all. This is a chunky historical fiction. It is almost 600 pages, but I absolutely devoured it and I loved it so much. So this essentially follows code breakers, women code breakers during World War II who work for Bletchley Park. You're following three very distinct, very different women who come from all walks of life. And you're following the friendships that they make with each other during their time at Bletchley Park and the way that they were instrumental in thwarting some Nazi missions during this time. Another really amazing thing about this book that I loved was the individual romantic relationships that each of the women form. Now, of course, that's not the main point of the story is these relationships, but it's definitely an important part because this is a very character driven historical fiction. So you're following these women as they meet, as they become co-breakers, and then you're following their individual relationships and the heartbreak and the tragedy that strikes them. And I absolutely loved every single second of this. So this is set in two timelines. The present day in this story is late 1940s, if I'm remembering correctly. And then the past timeline is in the early 1940s during the height of the war as they're becoming code breakers. But in the present day timeline, one of the women that we follow has actually been locked up in an asylum for quite some time. And that is because she has some secrets about what happened at Bletchley Park. She believes that there was a traitor at Bletchley Park and a spy and that caused some very bad things to happen. And so she has been locked up kind of to keep her quiet basically. But she is now trying to reach out to these other women and she's like, I have information and I need you to help me. But the problem is by this point in the story, all of the women are estranged. There's a very serious reason why these women are estranged, but she has no other choice. She's got to reach out to the other two. And so you're following the other two women as they are trying to help the woman that is locked away. So I just found both timelines very important, very poignant. I love the mystery aspect and the present day perspective as you're trying to figure out who the traitor was back at Bletchley Park. And of course, all of the actions that they are taking during their time at Bletchley Park, trying to break these codes. And it just was absolutely phenomenal. So if you are a historical fiction lover, especially World War II historical fiction, and you are trying to find a book that you can really sink your teeth into, this is certainly the one to go for. All right, next, I want to talk about a romance that really came out of nowhere and blew me out of the water. I was not expecting to have such a bookish hangover when I was done reading this story, Every Summer After by Carly Fortune. So this is a childhood friends to lovers slash second chance romance type story because this follows Persephone Frazier. And when she is 13, her parents buy like this vacation home on the lake. And so she first goes there when she's 13 and she meets her next door neighbor, Sam, and they build an instant friendship. And then you're following them over five summers as they kind of grow into something more as they build a very serious romantic relationship. But when they were 18, something happened that tore them apart. And at the start of the story in the present day, Persephone is 30 years old and it has been 12 years since she's seen Sam. But she actually gets a call from Sam's older brother and he tells her that their mother has actually passed away. And she's devastated by this because she considered Sam's mom like a second mom to her. And so she knows she has to go back to the small town where their lakeside cabins were to pay her respects 
back to this woman but she also knows that means that she's going to see Sam again and that's going to open up wounds that never fully closed like she has been pining for Sam basically for the past 12 years she's never fully gotten over him and so she knows that this is going to be a very hard time so you're following her in the present as she's going back to this town as she's reconnecting with Sam and then of course you're following her over those several summers where she and Sam meet and they get to know each other they build a friendship and they build something more and of course what ultimately ended up tearing them apart and like I said I was not expecting to be blown away by this romance I was not expecting to have such a bookish hangover but kind of like similarly with Abby Jimenez I just felt the emotion in this story so rawly and it definitely affected me very very deeply now I will say that I didn't necessarily love the twist I didn't love the reason why Sam and Persephone broke apart and I'm definitely not excusing it because Persephone definitely took some actions that I do not agree with. But in the same way that I feel like we all grieve very differently, I also feel like we handle heartbreak very differently. And at that point in the story where Persephone makes those very bad decisions, she's feeling very unloved, very unwanted, undesired. And she kind of does something very, very extreme. And like I said, I'm not excusing it. I don't agree with it, but I understand why she did it. And trust me when I tell you in this story that she has literally been beating herself up over it for 12 years. She has definitely punished herself enough and justice has been served. And again, this is very young love. There's all the angst that goes along with it. I feel like Carly Fortune did a really good job of portraying those younger years in a very YA fashion. And then you have the present day where they are older, more experienced, wiser, and things like that. So I very much enjoyed this story. I loved it a lot. I loved the relationship between Persephone and Sam. And I believed so much in their connection and chemistry that I rooted for them and I wanted them to get over what happened in the past. And I feel like that's, again, a hallmark of a great book when you actively root for them to kind of overcome the issues, no matter how bad that they are. And so I loved it. When I initially read this, I gave it a five stars. This is one that I downgraded to a 4.5 just because I don't necessarily feel the emotions as deeply as I did of course when I finished it but I can again say that this book gave me a massive hangover. I absolutely loved it and I'm gonna go ahead and say here what I said when I initially reviewed this book because I reviewed this in the same wrap-up as I did Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren because I was doing a specific reading blog. I read Love in Other Words immediately after this one and you'll hear a lot of people who read Love in Other Words years ago when it first came out read this and absolutely hate it because they say it's a ripoff of Love in Other Words. Well first of all I'm going to say that the stories are different enough for you to be able to tell them apart. The same overall structure is similar in that it's very much childhood friends to lovers to break up to reconnection and things like that. However, I'm also going to say that this, in my opinion, was far superior in terms of writing than the Christina Lauren book. The Christina Lauren book was very superficial. It didn't dive nearly as deeply into the relationship in the past or the present as I feel like this one did. I really feel like you got to know the characters in here very, very deeply. And that's not the case in Christina Lauren books. But then again, in my opinion, Christina Lauren doesn't do anything with depth and you really don't get a lot of emotion in their stories. I feel like you got a lot of emotion in this. There were also a lot of technical issues and love in other words that were really ridiculous to me and I could not believe happened in that story. And so I was just rolling my eyes the entirety of the time. So I feel like if you really enjoyed love in other words, you should still give this one a chance because ultimately I just feel like it's overall better. And in fact, reading love in other words immediately after this one made me completely break up with Christina Lauren altogether because the stark differences in the quality of the writing and the storytelling were so vast that I could just not justify continuing with Christina Lauren as an author. That's how much better I thought this one was. So again, 4.5 and it definitely deserves a spot on this list. All right, y'all. Now these next three are going to be no stranger to you. I've not stopped talking about them since I've read them. And to be honest with you, some of these, I'm not entirely sure why I didn't give five stars. They remained at a 4.5 on my spreadsheet, but the lasting impression that they gave me is definitely five star worthy. Starting with Wayward by Amelia Hart. This was such a deeply atmospheric witchy novel that just came and like took my breath away. I described this book as a balm for my soul because this is a book that kind of made me realize why I love reading so much and I wasn't expecting it. I had almost absolutely no expectations going into the story and so to come out of the story with an experience like that was absolutely phenomenal. So this story follows three women over vastly different time periods, hundreds of years. You have one that's set in the 1600s kind of during the witch trials. You have one set in the early 1900s and then you have one set in present day and the only thing that really connects these women is that they are part of the wayward women line and all of them have a very deep connection and respect for nature. They have a deep connection to it. They can kind of talk to it commune with it and in some ways kind of get it to do what they want it to do. That's how deep their connection is with it. And you're following each individual woman in their own time periods and what they're going through and what they're struggling through. And at the core of this story, this book is really about what women have to endure at the hands of men and what we do to survive and how we thrive after the survival. And for the most part, the timelines in here are not directly connected. Like I said, their only real connection is that they are kind of from the same family line of women and their deep connection in nature. But you do see how the events from 1600 kind of reverberates through the 1900s and then the present day timeline. This is certainly very character driven. So if you don't like more character driven stories, you're probably not going to love this, but I absolutely adored following each woman. I loved each perspective equally. I was very 
connected to them. Like I said, it was very atmospheric. It was darkly whimsical and I absolutely loved the dark whimsy of the story. The vibes in this were just incredibly immaculate. And if you love stories like that, I cannot recommend this one enough. Another amazing magical realism story with the darkly whimsical vibes, Starling House by Alexi e. Harrow. This is one that I actually went in very cautiously because Alexi e. Harrow's previous books never really struck my interest. I was really worried that I wasn't going to enjoy this one, but I loved the vibes that I was getting. And this was an October book of the month selection and it just felt perfect for that time of year. So I went ahead and bit the bullet and picked it up and boy, am I glad I did. So this fellow is our main character, Opal, and she is from small town Eden, Kentucky. Eden, Kentucky is a dead or dying town. Nobody wants to visit. Nobody wants to live there. And she is desperate to get her younger brother, Jasper, out of this town. She has been his caretaker since their mother died when they were both pretty young and she is determined to do whatever it takes to get Jasper out. Now, Eden, Kentucky itself, like I said, it's a dead and dying town. It doesn't really have anything notable about it except for Starling House, which was built by a very eccentric reclusive woman called East Starling. And you definitely dive into East Starling's background here. But one of the main things she's known for is writing this very dark children's story that became very famous after she went missing. She went missing and nobody knows what happens to her, but her house still remains. It's just as eccentric and weird as she was. Nobody knows why she built it and what the purpose of it was, but she went missing. Her children's story kind of blew up and that's really what Eden, Kentucky is famous for. And this is a house that Opal has kind of been fascinated with for years. And she's actually dreamt of this house for years and she doesn't understand why, but she passes by it on her way from work. And one night she's passing by it and she actually meets Arthur Starling, who is the current ward and caretaker of Starling House. And Arthur randomly offers Opal a job as the housekeeper because the house is not doing great. Arthur really is not taking care of it. It needs some tender loving care and he wants Opal to do it. And the house wants Opal to do it. That's definitely a thing in here. Starling House is definitely a very sentient house. It is a character all on its own and it wants Opal there and it's going to do whatever it takes to get Opal there. And so you're following Opal as she takes this job. She doesn't really understand why she's inclined to take a job from a stranger in this very infamous house in her town, but she knows that it's going to pay her a lot more than what she's making now. And that is very important to her. So you're following her as every day she goes and she starts to spruce up Starling House and she gives it the love that it deserves and she gets to know Starling House. She finds out a little bit more about its history and why it was built about East Starling. And she learns all of this stuff and she also starts to fall for Arthur. And I absolutely adored the love story in here. The love story between these two is probably one of my favorite love stories that I read this year. And it wasn't even supposed to be a romance. I just absolutely loved the chemistry between the two. You know, Arthur is very dark and broody and he knows that he has this destiny. He's determined to be the last ward of Starling House. Find out more about what that means and why in this book. And you're also following Opal who starts to love him and she's going to do whatever she can to help Arthur kind of break the curse that's happening here. I can tell you why the reason this didn't get like a full five stars is because as you get more and more into the story, it definitely dives more into the fairy tale-esque. And so I had a little bit of a disconnect there because I don't often love the abstractness and the whimsy of fairy tales, but still overall this book very much worked for me. I absolutely adored the vibes, the atmosphere, and like I said, the relationship between Opal and Arthur. And of course, I'm going to highly recommend this one because this book just stole my heart in 2023. And then of course, the last magical realism one that I have to talk with you about today, The Unmaking of June Farrow by Adrienne Young. I read Spells for Forgetting by Adrienne Young earlier this year, and I really enjoyed that one. And so I had high hopes going into this one, but I didn't know that it was going to stick with me like it did. So this follows our main character, June Farrow, and she's determined to be the last of the line of Farrow women who she believes are cursed because every single woman as they go through life starts to eventually become mad. They start to have hallucinations, delusions, seeing things that they're not there. And eventually this ends their life. And so she's determined not to continue. She's not going to have any children. Every single Farrow woman only ever has one child and it's a daughter. And then again, the tradition continues of them losing their minds and eventually dying. And she's not going to have it. She's going to be the last of the Farrow women. But at the start of the story, her grandmother has actually recently passed away of the curse. And after she passes away, June starts to uncover some secrets about the curse that she never before knew. And it starts to change her outlook and her mind on things. I really don't want to say more about why because the overall speculative element of the story is not revealed on the dust jacket and I feel like finding out what that is is part of the journey of the story so I don't want to say more about the speculative element but I absolutely love what Adrian Young did in here and also this is like a second chance romance but it's not a conventional second chance romance. If you read this story you're probably going to understand what I mean and what I'm talking about but I absolutely love the way that she did the romance in here. Again I loved the vibes. This definitely has an underlying mystery in here so you definitely have that darker mysterious theme going on. I just remember really enjoying this one. And again, this is one that has just stuck with me. Like I keep thinking about it. And because of that, I knew that it deserved a spot on my favorite books of the year. All right, everybody, here we go. We're getting into my five star reads for the year. And like I said, these are not ranked. All of these five stars are very, very different. And I love them all for very different reasons. So I'm just going to go and talk about them in no particular order, starting with My Dear Hamilton by Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy. This one is another one that came out of left field and completely swept me off my feet. I was not expecting to absolutely adore this one as much as I did. So this is what I would call 
call a biographical historical fiction because this story is written as though Eliza Hamilton herself is telling you her story. And this is another historical fiction that is not small, y'all. It is nearing almost 700 pages and I was not expecting that when I started this. But this is another one that just absolutely flew by and I was so immersed and engaged in the world of Eliza Hamilton that I didn't want to end. And by the time that I finished this book, I was so devastated that I was never going to know Eliza Hamilton and for all intents and purposes, the world was never really going to know Eliza Hamilton because a lot of the sources that they used to create this book were not primary sources from Eliza herself because there weren't really any. So there's a lot that we still don't know about Eliza Hamilton, but I think that this book does a fantastic job of bringing to light this absolutely courageous, strong, remarkable woman who experienced so much loss and grief and yes, even betrayal during her life, but she handled it with such grace and dignity and steadfastness. And I love that they were able to bring her story to life in this because we all know Alexander Hamilton, right? We all know the contributions that he made to America, but you don't often hear about the contributions that Eliza Hamilton herself made to America and what she had to endure as the wife of Alexander Hamilton and what it meant to be married to a man like him who was so ambitious and who was so consistently trying to overcome a childhood that gave him much shame. And so he wanted to be well known. He wanted to be famous and he certainly was, but you have no idea what it was like to be married to a man like him. And then of course he was part of basically America's first ever sex scandal and Eliza had to bear that and she had to endure that. But through all of this, her love for Hamilton never really wavered. And she actually ended up living 50 years after he was shot and killed. So you're following her before Hamilton, during Hamilton, and then of course her life after Hamilton because her life didn't end when Hamilton died, but she spent the remainder of her life trying to make sure that his legacy lived on, that America really knew what he went through and sacrificed for their country. And she's such an amazing woman. And yes, I absolutely consider her a hero. She's definitely one of my new favorite historical figures. And I'm so thankful that I read this. I was not planning on reading this when I read it, but I did. And I'm so very grateful because this is absolutely one of the best books that I read in 2023. And then next we have another Abby Jimenez. It was actually the first Abby Jimenez that I ever read, Part of Your World. This story gets a lot of praise and a lot of recognition and it's for good reason. I'm not going to spend too terribly much time talking about this one because a lot of the same aspects that I loved about the friend zone are very much present in here. You have the fantastic male and female love interests. You have the fantastic chemistry and the banter and you absolutely have the harder hitting emotional elements. This is one of those stories that I had to kind of stop and step away from because I was reading the story and it was at the point where they were kind of going through like a third act breakup and I could absolutely feel the emotions. It felt like I personally was going through a breakup because I remember those feelings so distinctly from my own personal relationship history and it was just so devastating. It was so emotionally raw when I was reading the story and it's because of that that I gave this an easy five stars. This is one of the best romances that I've ever read and it's actually an age gap romance. It follows our main character Dr. Alexis Montgomery and she is from a very prestigious well-known family in the medical community where they are. Her family actually has a legacy of always having a Montgomery in residence since the hospital was open and now Alexis who is an ER doctor is kind of expected to take up that mantle. She's expected to stay at the hospital and she's gunning for a promotion. I think of like chief of the ER and things like that and one day she's driving home from a funeral. I believe this is set in Minnesota and so she's driving through a very rural remote part of the state and all of a sudden she swerves to avoid hitting an animal and she ends up in a ditch and suddenly somebody comes up behind her and offers to tow her out and that is our love interest Daniel Grant. So he tows her out of the ditch. She's hungry. She's got to pee. There's really nothing else around so she stops at a local watering hole which seems to be the only thing open and lo and behold Daniel Grant is there too. Now Daniel Grant is kind of the honorary mayor of this little small town. Everybody knows him. He's very blue collar. He's very salt of the earth. Very down to earth. Very charming handsome man and he ends up reconnecting with Alexis when she walks in and they go home together and it's very out of character for either one of them to have a one night stand. It's a very passionate night. They have a really good time but Alexis kind of wakes up in the morning. She freaks out and she hightails it out of there but she ultimately ends up getting back in contact with him and this is the development of their relationship but the problem is is that Alexis knows that Daniel will never be accepted by her family because he's very opposite. He lives a very different life. Like I said he's very blue collar, very salt of the earth. She's from a very wealthy prestigious well-known family and she knows that they will not accept him but also she's actually just come out of a very toxic relationship with another doctor that she works with. He was very kind of like emotionally abusive, very toxic but her family wants Alexis to be with him and so she just knows that Daniel is never going to fit in her world and so that is the complication that comes between the two of them and it was just so well done. It was very nuanced. Abby Jimenez did a great job of bringing these characters, their love, their relationship, their trials, their tribulations to life and I cannot recommend this enough. This deserves all of the hype and the buzz that it's getting. If you are looking for a wonderfully hard-hitting romance, I highly, highly recommend. 
All right. And the next book I want to share with y'all is Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. This was an impulse read in 2023. And I know you're thinking, how can you impulsively read a thousand page book? Well, I did. I just had a hankering to go ahead and dive into it. And I took about two months to really take my time, annotated the heck out of the story. I actually read this while also kind of devouring the wiki for it because Brandon Sanderson does not like to info dump. And with a world that is as complicated and complex and deep as this one, I knew that I was going to be completely lost and confused the entirety of the time that I was reading it unless I used the wiki. And so I kind of studied, I kind of studied the wiki while I was reading this. And basically all of these tabs are contextual and historical information. I wrote in the story important things that I needed to know. I actually took notes in a notebook. So I have a notebook filled with all of this information for when I go into book number two. And the reason why I rated this five stars is just because it was such an incredible journey. It was such an amazing reading experience, just getting lost in this world little by little every single day. I am not even going to try to explain to you what this is about because this is an extremely complicated world. I wouldn't even know where to begin, but it's basically because of the reading experience that I had with this story that really made me give it a five stars. I enjoyed this way more than I was expecting based on my experience with the Mistborn trilogy, which I didn't love, but I absolutely loved everything about this. I loved the characters. I loved getting to know them. It's definitely slow. It is definitely tedious, but I found that immersively reading this, so reading it with my eyeballs and listening to it helped me a lot. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm very much looking forward to jumping into the second one when I can. I don't know if that's going to be at some point in 2024 because I do have a lot of fantasies that I'm trying to get to and I'm trying to complete, but I know that this will be waiting for me when I'm ready for it. And this was a highlight of my year for sure. And then the last book I'm going to mention in this video is Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. This is the third and final book in his Nevernight Chronicles. So I obviously can't say too terribly much about this book, but the Nevernight Chronicles is an adult fantasy, a very adult fantasy. So don't confuse it for YA. The follows our main character, Mia Corberry, and she is an assassin. When she was 10 years old, she watched her father hung for treason. And then she watched her mother and baby brother kind of be stolen away. And she's presumed them dead this entire time. And even though she was a young girl, she vowed revenge for her family. She was going to kill the politicians that were responsible for her father's death. And when she's young, she ends up on the keep of Mercurio, who was a former acolyte of the Red Church, which is basically a school for assassins. So you're following her as she's taken under Mercurio's wing, and she's kind of prepared to be sent to the Red Church. And the very first book follows her as she is sent to the Red Church and as she is training to be an assassin. And then the story kind of goes from there because it doesn't stop and end with the Red Church. There's a lot that goes on in these stories, and I absolutely love them. Mia is also a Darkin, which means she has the ability to kind of manipulate shadows. And so she has a cat named Mr. Kindly that is with her in shadow form at all times and kind of eats her fear. So that's a very interesting part of this story as well. I just absolutely love this story with my whole heart. And I was very nervous going into this because I didn't know what to expect. And I didn't know what the outcome was going to be for these characters that I loved so much. But I got to the ending of this one and I was absolutely bawling. I was sobbing. I think that this is the book that made me cry the most just because of how perfect the ending of the story was. Now, don't misunderstand. Jay Kristoff is not afraid to put his characters through some stuff. He is not afraid to kill some of your favorite characters. And that's a especially true in his Empire of the Vampire series. But I just thought that the ending of this was absolute perfection. I miss this world. I miss these characters so much. I would love to see maybe Jay Kristoff explore something else in the same world following different characters because I think there is certainly room for that. So I wouldn't close myself off to reading more in the series. This was an easy five stars. This is probably one of the easiest five stars that I gave in 2023. And I highly recommend this series if you have not read it and you love fantasy because it was phenomenal. All right, everybody, that is it. Those were my top 10 books plus one honorable mention for 2023. I did want to quickly mention that I have made the conscious decision not to make a worst slash most disappointing video going forward because I personally don't necessarily appreciate when content creators are making videos that are there to specifically bash books. I've seen a lot of that going around recently with Fourth Wing. Like people are legitimately just reading and making a video to bash the book and trying to yuck other people's yum. And that's not really what I want to do. And so I kind of feel like creating a worst slash most disappointing video is not much different than that. Really the only reason behind making it is for the views and I'm not about that life. So I may touch upon some of my least favorite books or my most disappointing books in some of the vlogs that I'm going to be making coming out, but I'm not actually going to be doing a dedicated video to those books. And I apologize if that is disappointing to anybody, but I hope that you understand. Of course, please comment down below and let me know some of your top books I would love to know. Or if you've made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, go ahead and leave me a crown or king queen emoji. I always appreciate when you take the time to leave me a comment, even if it's an emoji. I love the engagement with y'all and it absolutely helps my channel so, so much. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week. Mostly I do too, depending on what I can do. And I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below along with books that I may talk about in a video. Until next time, guys. Bye.